You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hey everyone, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. I wanted to share with you some research findings from a book that I've just finished reading. The book is called The Founder's Dilemma, and it's by Noam Wasserman. I'll put a link in the show notes. And the research is about entrepreneurs, um, founders of what he calls high potential startups. So it's uh, his research is looking at startups in the life sciences and technology field. I wanted to talk about it is because I think it's interesting for anyone who's thinking of doing a startup whether or not it's um, seeking venture capital, because it is worth saying that this book is also very much based on research looking at startups that take on venture capital and that um, attempt to grow very quickly through using VC funding. So it's a, a book about a very particular type of startup, but it has a lot of really interesting statistical research about the things that entrepreneurs typically do and the things that typically go wrong, and some of the things that may be less typical but tend to work better. I really recommend the book. I don't. I don't agree with um, all of the conclusions in the book. Um, the the author Noam Wasserman has a, a very particular theory about what drives entrepreneurs that I think kind of misses the the point a little bit. But the research findings that he presents are amazing, really interesting, because he's taken a sample of hundreds of startups over a 10-year period, and he's looked at all of the kind of key early decisions and the key characteristics that those startups made. So one of the things that he talks about is the choice of co-founders, whether or not to go into a startup with co-founders, and if so, what kind of co-founders and what characteristics do co-founders have and he's looked at the difference between successful teams and less successful teams businesses that were able to get going and actually become viable enterprises and those that didn't make it and for those that didn't make it people problems and especially disputes between the co-founders tended to be the key issue that he focuses on uh, from his research as what brings down these startups So I wanted to talk about some of the findings to do with co-founders. I think it's worth saying in the beginning that the sample of startups that he's working with, because they're high-tech or life sciences, and because they're going for venture capital, they're very much based on a sample of companies that were founded principally by co-founders. That Only 15% of his sample were solo entrepreneurs, And I think if you read something like The Millionaire Next Door by Thomas Stanley, his sample were much less high tech, but um, they were based around entrepreneurs that became millionaires. And a lot of those were single entrepreneurs, if I remember rightly, a lot of the people that he surveyed. So the first thing I wanted to say about the choice of co-founders is, do you need co-founders? Can you avoid a lot of the stress and issues by simply being a solo entrepreneur, I think there's a real opportunity to consider that route and simply avoid a lot of the potential hassles. But if you do think you need co-founders, then it's really worth looking at why and what what your reasoning behind having co-founders is. Because one of the things that Noam Wasserman points out in his study of startups is that People tend to choose co-founders who are very similar to themselves in terms of both skills and background and networks. So there tends to be very much lower diversity between co-founders than you would expect just by chance, however you look at the data. So, for example, one of the companies uh, in his sample that he gives as, as a, a kind of typical example is one that was founded by uh, classmates um, at business school. They were all doing an MBA together and they decided to start a business and so forth. Um, But those are obviously going to be people who have very much a similar mindset. They've been in the same educational institution. They've undergone the same training. 
they have all the same ideas, so they really lack diversity in terms of ideas, but they also lack diversity in terms of networks. They know the same people, so they don't really get any advantage from each other in terms of being able to draw on resources or expertise or, or business connections or whatever. I thought that was a really interesting point, and it reminded me of a book that I read called The Wisdom of the Crowds by James Surarecki, I think that's his name. I'll put a link in the show notes again to that one. And in that book, uh, The Wisdom of Crowds, he talks about how much stronger decision-making in teams is if different people in the team have very different backgrounds, networks, skills, knowledge to draw on. So it strikes me that what you're looking for, if you do take on co-founders, the reasoning should be to maximize the opportunity of a division of labor and the opportunity of drawing on different resources, which means not choosing someone who's just like you because you think the same and you can both communicate very easily because you, you come from the same background, but rather I think the opportunity there, if you're going to have a co-founder, is to go for someone who's significantly different from you in terms of their skills, their expertise, their networks, because that way you're going to be able to draw on somebody who complements you and who is able to fill in for your weaknesses. Another thing that um, Noam Wasserman talks about in this book, um, The Founder's Dilemma, is how often co-founders fall out over roles and responsibilities. And this is, again, probably because they're coming from very similar um, backgrounds and they have very similar skills or personalities. So I thought that was very interesting in terms of thinking about the fundamental question, should you have co-founders? And if, if so, why uh, would you want co-founders? And for me, the answer there is to use the division of labor to be able to draw on somebody who has different strengths to you and not only in terms of their skills, but in terms of their networks and their personality and the kind of role that they'd like to play within the business so that you can really have all the benefits of that diversity. Now, of course, with diversity comes communication problems. You need to be able to understand. All, all of the co-founders need to be able to understand each other. And so there has to be a fundamental similarity in terms of core values and in terms of the approach and what you want to get from the venture. But beyond that, I think the diversity is, is where the real opportunity comes in. Another thing that really struck me from this book, uh, The Founder's Dilemma, was the research uh, that he did into how co-founders knew each other, how they came to know each other uh, before they started the business. And he looks at which are the most stable teams. And the, the different teams that he looks at are teams formed from friends and family, so people who know each other and their friends and they decide to start a business, or brothers or other family members who choose to go into business together. He also looks at people who have been co-workers, so they've worked together, got to know each other like that, and they choose to start a business. That was, in fact, my situation. I, my co-founder was a co-worker, and there was another guy who... Uh, we wanted to get on board as well, but he, he decided not to. Um, but he was also a co-worker. And the other option is strangers. And this is, I guess, where people are finding someone who's got what they think are the right skills or connections or whatever, and then starting a business with them uh, pretty much from scratch. Now, the interesting thing about the findings of in the book, um, Founder's Dilemma, is that the most stable teams were teams made from co-workers so people who'd worked together previously were most likely to succeed in a startup together the second most stable were teams formed from strangers and the least stable of those three categories were friends and family and in a way this is not surprising because with friends and family you know there are previous relationship dynamics that need to be adjusted into a new working setting where you actually are now you have a different relationship and so forth but of course a very large proportion of people who start businesses together start with friends and family because that's kind of who you know and that's the opportunity that, that often seems to present itself now what Noam Wasserman suggests in the book is that the, the reason that the co-workers 
are more successful is because they're more willing to have the difficult discussions. They're more willing to talk about the uncomfortable subjects of equity splits and and what's going to happen if we don't get on and how we're going to resolve disputes and, and all these kinds of things. And he suggests that with friends and family, there's more of an assumed, oh, we'll just work it out as we go type approach. And that's why he suggests that the friends and family are less stable. And he also points out that with friends and family, you have that previous dynamic in the relationship that has to be adjusted to a new working relationship dynamic. The relationship, in a way, has to be rebooted. Now, you could argue that people who are mature and self-aware can make a conscious choice to have those difficult discussions and to address those relationship dynamics and can go into business with friends but still beat the odds. But I just think empirically it's really interesting to note that those are actually the least stable teams and therefore it seems like it's also something to to look at with caution. I do just want to make a couple more points about this question of the stability of founding a business with friends and family that comes out of this research. One is I think it's hard to know what the difference might be between founding a business with friends and founding a business with family members. I think it's highly likely that some of the sort of psychological baggage that Noam Wasserman is talking about might be stronger in family relationships and harder to overcome than it might be with friends. So it would be interesting to untangle that and to look at teams that were just made from friends as opposed to teams that were made from family members and see whether they were the friend teams were any more successful. But even if we do assume that founding with friends is less stable than former co-workers, I don't think that means you can't be friends with people that you found a business with. There's a great quote by John D. Rockefeller, which is, a friendship founded on business is a good deal better than a business founded on friendship. So I think the point is that you know you can become great friends through the experience of doing business together, but it's that initial starting dynamic that is the one that may be easier to establish with co-workers because you work together than it, it might be with friends, at least according to this empirical research. And the other thing to bear in mind, I think, is that I, I do believe it's also very important to have a friendship and support network outside your business so that you have people who you can bounce ideas off and sort of share your struggle with and your stresses and pains and and thoughts about what's happening for you in the business who you're not also working with during the day because I I just think that gives you a chance to reflect and to think about the experience and if you found with your very closest friends you may then not have people that you can talk to um, outside of business to help you really process what's going on for you. And that kind of support network, I think, is also very, very um, helpful. And it also, what also struck me is how, given that co-workers are the most stable teams, if you're in a job and you're thinking about doing entrepreneurship, it's kind of worth looking around to see you know, people who you've worked with, who you've had that good working relationship with, uh, that you can consider as potential co-founders if you think you need a co-founder for whatever reason. I found the research very interesting and if you're thinking about starting a business uh, I do think it's a useful book and there's lots of other um, issues to do with the kinds of conflicts and questions that that founders face that come up in the book and maybe I'll do another episode on on some of the other questions. But I thought the question of, you know, who you co-found a business with and what their characteristics are and what you might be looking for and what you might want to be careful about, I thought that was very interesting. Thanks so much for listening. If you do enjoy the show, please do give me a review on iTunes because that would be really helpful. And I'd also love to hear any thoughts that you have about this subject. How did you choose your co-founders? And uh, how's it working out? Or if there's anything else that you think is... uh, really important to talk about that I've missed, just send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time. Thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. 
If you have feedback about the show, please email jake at thevoluntarylife.com. If you enjoyed this program, please share the podcast with your friends or click the donate button on thevoluntarylife.com.